physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. That's so close. I just put some degreaser on, I gotta wipe it down, but you can see this is all carbon. Um, it's gonna need virtually no body work at all. We're gonna put on just a heavy primer, and I think that will be all I need to do is a heavy primer, sand it down, and uh, I, I really don't think I'm gonna have any filler at all at this point, so I'm really happy with how this has turned out. I'm gonna quickly wipe this off several times so I don't get any dust coming through. We'll just keep layer and layer till it comes off completely clean. Put some, uh, can't talk. Primer, sand it, paint it. Let's get to work. I'm super excited to finally be done. This is the air intakes. The rubber boots are on. The tie to the front cowling. It's three parts. The air filter goes in here, but I'm gonna go ahead and attach. These two pieces come apart at the middle, put a little bead of uh, RTV around the joint so it literally will be airtight. And then this part, if I need to work on the engine, comes off independently. And these will stay on until the point if I need to do an overhaul, pop that little light bead of RTV that connects it to the engine and uh, pull them right back off. This comes off, that's where my oil fill with my oil funnel is built in. So let's get it installed, super excited. It's going on for the last time, back to work. Okay guys, I'm gonna quickly answer a couple questions some of you had. The air filter going into Scrappy, some were worried it might not be big enough. And most of the people that asked that question is coming from an automotive side. Simply, 780 cubic inches on an aircraft only flows the volume of about 350 cubic inches on an automobile. The difference is six to 7,000 RPM on a race engine in an automobile. In an aircraft, I'm running 2,700. So I'm running half the air volume you would expect. Add on top of that, then in an aircraft, you get the benefit of always flying around. We actually make ram air pressure just from flying. So you size an air filter, not like a car, you size it as aircraft would, and there is a big adjustment for that. So I do know that this air filter works on this engine. This is what I use to set some world records, three close course world records in my race plane I pulled it out of. It's also run at Reno, and I did four measuring devices to measure the air. Ram air pressure inside the upper deck pressure plenum, air right before the air filter, air right behind the air filter to measure the delta between the air passing through and how much pressure I lost right there and the creating a vacuum and then also right inside the primary air box and the traditional one that's right at the intake of the engine itself that displays on the engine. So I have a box that measures all those locations. So I always check that, do a mass airflow check. The next question I had is, do you have a drain for water? So um, for a lot of you worried, what happens if you fly into rain? Well, it's amazing. Aircraft engines, they fly into rain all the time. And what has happened? The water actually just flows in, goes through the air filter and the engine just eats it up. And that sounds a little crazy. But we aren't taking a garden hose and putting it in. It's only taking in what the max rain can allow. But as an added backup for safety of if I was washing the plane or if I went into extra heavy rain, I go a little bit beyond. Then I always put a drain in the bottom trap that I created inside the intake of the filter. And there is a drain and it drains out the bottom of the plane. And since it's on the upper deck, high pressure side of the filter, if water does go in there in flight, I have air created pressure pushing and it just will spit the water back out at high velocities. I do like to have a secondary way to push the water out, but a lot of aircraft, if you fly in the rain, the filter is literally right on the front of the airplane and that rain just goes through it. And if you're a race guy, you understand why that doesn't hurt it. Because in racing, if you want to cool your engine down, you inject water into it. You literally inject water. The next thing I had people ask about is what about an alternate air source? That is absolutely going in. This is the start of it. 
Um, this is so that where the air comes through the filter, right now I've got it just piped into the engine to do some airflow testing and ground checks. But that bend is coming out and there'll be a sweet carbon bend with a bypass secondary carbon tube, this one, that will go to a spring-loaded door. That spring will be sized so that at full power under all conditions, it stays shut and all the air is coming through the filter. However, if the filter were to clog up with dirt or that's unlikely, it means I wasn't doing a good job at maintenance, but that could happen. Or the more likely scenario, which hopefully will never happen with Scrappy, I'm not building an ice capable aircraft. But if you inadvertently flew into ice and you had ice and snow crest up and clogged the filter, you need to have an alternate air source. So that will come through this tube on a bypass out the right side of the engine with a spring gate. And the only time it will ever open is as the filter starts to clog. If it starts to clog, the engine will create a vacuum and start to open the spring rate door only when it has to so it can keep pulling as much air through the filter as possible. That air, for those of you who are wondering, is coming from the low pressure side of the engine, which is below the cylinders after the air has gone through the cylinders to cool them. Now the air is now a little bit warmer and it comes from under the engine on the low pressure deck side. That's my alternate air source. Thanks for asking the questions. We'll get it done later. You guys know the drill. Back to work. Okay, guys, we're getting closer. I just put this on and finished the last final little bit of sanding. We got lucky on this one. It turned out really good. I'm super excited about it. It's unbelievably lightweight. It feels um, light enough or lighter in just the way filling such a big cowling like it came out of a mold completely. We're having a, a cowling that was 20 or 30 molds and pieces put together and then sand it all out and and uh, we sanded out all the joints and the overlaps and then we bag layers over top of it to suck it up and get the thickness. It's dang near a cowling right out of a mold. So I'm really proud of it. Super excited to get it done. It's crazy amount of work to get to this. I don't recommend it. <laughs> kind of sucks, but uh, in the end of the day, it's worth it. I'm, I'm really happy. I'm gonna do a, a white base and then we'll put some silver on it, a couple logos on it. You guys know the drill. All right, guys, I'm getting ready to put the final touches on Scrappy. We've already test run it, drove it all over the airport. And I've got all the lines ran and already done, obviously, oil lines, gas lines. However, I always like to do it one time with just some cheap, quick, easy hoses made from a local House of Hose specialty style shop but it's not what i really want to run ultimately on the aircraft long term but so many times i'll do it and then i want to change the length a half inch or a quarter inch so i like to run it one way and then when the whole plane's done ready to cowl up i go back through and look hey can i save two inches of line here and save some weight so i called up aircraft specialty and they make custom aviation lines so here's some oil lines i'm changing out these are fuel lines they're fire sleeved and protected and uh, have an uh, abrasion resistant edge. So, and then these are super cool. These are brake lines. You can see right down here, I had to use a couple different fittings, but if you look right here, uh, they're able to do adaption where I actually have one size fitting on this size of the hose and a different size on this one. They can adapt it in my hose itself and save me several ounces per line. So I'm gonna get these installed on my brakes. The other line's hooked up. We'll tidy this up and then we'll throw the cowling on. All right, guys. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this part. This is simply uh, NACA. It goes on the bottom of the cowling right there. And you can see when I built this, I made two inlets. The purpose of that is oftentimes one of the problems with heating and cooling is that they pull NACAs from different locations or they have two NACAs and even if one's right next to the other, the air, the way it's coming around the fuselage off the prop, puts more air in one NACA than another. So it still works, but doing two holes through a single NACA for your heat and your air allows those two lines, one will pass through all the heat systems in the exhaust the other line goes to the fresh air, but what's critical is when they come together in my mixing valve where I can adjust 
hot and cold, the pressure, because they're coming in the same location, is equal. And if you have equal pressure, then the dial that goes from hot to cold adjustment is very linear and flat. Sometimes a lot of people will do two different NACAs and sometimes in two different locations or on the same location opposite sides of the fuselage, but because the air swirls one direction off the prop, you might have to turn the dial all the way to hot and if you barely move it, it goes ice cold because one NACA has so much power when the two blend, it sends the pressure back the other way. I put this on the belly because the bottom of the cowling is tipped up like that. So the air goes straight into it and gets the maximum blast. So that's the bottom. And I want to introduce another helper working. We got Ron over there tinkering away. This is my oldest son, Dylan. Put a big. <laughs> <laughs> he just got a, 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 a tattoo right here and I just smacked it. <laughs> I didn't remember. <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> this is my oldest son, Dylan. He has been helping out recently, sanding on all kinds of parts. He's really good at doing fine line, tape lines for uh, paint. It's been awesome having him tinker away over here, but my oldest is now helping me out. He's working here full time. So if you thought we got a lot done before, I got another payday on the job. <laughs> Back to work. We're getting closer. The cowling is finally painted, so I'm super excited to get to this phase. Now we're going to start in, uh, attaching the lights. This should be a dang near snap fit, and it is. So we're going to stick in this light, this light, this light. Um, we're just drilling out right now all the holes for the nut plates, and you can see this will go right there, the air vent. NACAs will go here and another drill over there. Okay guys, what I'm doing now, I've got two done, one to go, masked off an area. Now the lights are bonded in just with silicone and they're put pressed into a double step. So they'd never come out as it is, but as an added precaution, I could put glued down embeds with little bolts and washers to hold it. Um, this is a little cleaner, I like this better. This is a polyurethane windshield adhesive. Um, you gotta have a special gun to push it out. It's really strong. The downside to using this as my connection is if I needed to replace the light, it's gonna take me probably a half hour to get it out. The good side to it is there won't be any vibration whatsoever. It's completely watertight and it's never gonna move. The other nice thing about using a polyurethane bond in like this especially where I've got the front so flush set and completely sealed, is that I won't get that vibration chafing that creates that black powdery dust around the light lenses. Um, it always just looks dirty. So this is absolutely permanent. I would never do this with a light that isn't LED 
These are all LED, they'll probably outlive me. So this is something I feel very comfortable with, but if I did need to replace it, a little bit of screwdriver work on the back, pull all the polyurethane off, pop it out from the front, just breaking that silicone seal. I'd have to just clean it all up and then rebond it back in. It really would be a half hour, maybe 45 minute project. But this as it is, is completely permanent. Back to work. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys, it's officially time to cowl up Scrappy for the first time, fully painted, put the grills on it. I'm super excited. And look how cute Scrappy looks really low to the ground. This is my <laughs> how to get in a cuff easy way. It's 20 inches lower. We just dropped the suspension down so we could cowl it up, um, which has been nice to work on. I put it way up high to work underneath it, drop it down low to work on the top. But Ron, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> we for two months. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it up and hot rod it around the airport for a minute. Make sure everything's good. Back to work. Yes. Good day. <laughs> I'm gonna put some wings on this bad.